Welcome to the Life Star Training and Education Center. My name is Todd and I am really excited that you're joining me for this one. This is a really cool case. I was the paramedic on this call, so I am excited from a personal point of view and also because it shows something that you learn about in paramedic school and you refresh on it and you read articles on it and you study about it, but you don't often see it quite as clear cut as you see it here. I don't want to give away too much information. I'm only giving hints and I'm telling a story here. So I'm going to let things unfold slowly and let you go through the same process I did as I saw all this stuff. So let's start with this. This is a 12 lead that looks very routine. We've all seen 12 leads that are similar to this. And I'm going to give you a second to look at it and think about it. And I recommend you press pause so you can look at it for as long as you want before you continue and we'll talk about it. So now that you're back from pause, I'm sure that your eyes were drawn to the same prominent feature that my eyes were drawn to, which are these pacer spikes. So what, appear, what appears to be happening here is a ventricular paced rhythm. Now when I read a 12 lead, I go through the same process from beginning to end every time so that I don't miss anything. I have this uh, muscle memory from practice, practice, practice. I read every 12 lead the same way beginning to end and I start here. Not the doc in the box part because I don't like the doc in the box and he's frequently wrong. I'm talking about over on the left side down here. I start with the PR interval. The PR interval is not necessarily the most important part of a 12 lead. It's just the place where I begin. Some things computers do better than people. Counting and measuring are two things that computers can do better than us. And another thing is sometimes they're really good at finding P waves. So I start in the PR interval because if the, if the entry here is zero, it means the cardiac monitor doesn't think there are P waves in this 12 lead. If there's a number there, then it tells me the monitor does think it's finding P waves, so then it's a sinus rhythm. It doesn't mean the monitor is right, and you still have to confirm it yourself, but this is where I begin the process. The next thing I look at is the QRS. I'm looking for a wide versus narrow QRS determination. Do you remember what the cutoff is for QRS and whether it's wide or not? That's right, it's 120. So that one was 126. So the next place my eyes go to on the 12 lead is lead V1. So you, I can make a determination if there is an atrial ventricular conduction delay causing this wide QRS, is it a left bundle branch or a right bundle branch block? In this case, you have your very typical tracing for a left bundle branch block. So there's my answer there. It's beginning to look very much like a standard ventricular paced rhythm. Next thing I look at is axis. The QRS axis is here. I am going to put a link to a different video at the end of this one where I talk about how I like to look at cardiac axis. My brain just does not wrap around the principles of up, down, down, up, and down, down, up, down, and all that stuff. I don't like it, and my brain rejects it. So I like to look at cardiac access from a completely different point of view, and I have a short video on that as well. So we're back to the original 12 lead, and some of you are ahead of the game thinking, uh, he's talking about paced rhythms, and he's excited about something. This guy is about to talk about Scarbosa. And if that's what you're thinking, you would be right. But what is a Scarbosa? This is a Scarbosa. This is Elena Scarbosa. She is a cardiologist of Argentinian descent, and in 1996, she wrote a very important article about interpreting STEMI in the presence of a paste or left bundle branch block rhythm. Up until that point, EKGs were used primarily to diagnose previous MIs, and since EKGs main use was diagnosing previous MIs, STEMI versus NSTEMI was not a critical principle to distinguish. In 
all the way since 1945, the conventional wisdom was in the presence of a left bundle branch block or a paste rhythm, you cannot interpret STEMI. Don't even try. Don't even talk about it. Well, we learn that that's no longer true, thanks to Elena Scarbosa. So what did she actually do? She did a post hoc study. A post hoc study is where you take data from a study that was collected for an entirely different purpose, and you answer a different question using that data. In this case, she took the GUSTO-1 study, which was a TPA versus streptokinase study, with lots and lots of patients, some of whom were diagnosed with MI. And she said, we got a lot of data here and a lot of 12 leads, and we have a lot of patients that were having an MI. So let's take a look at the ones that have left bundle branch blocks and see if there's anything in them, if we look at enough of them, that we can find a marker that can tell us how to interpret STEMI, even with that left bundle branch block. Here you see two different waveforms that are what you would expect to have in the presence of a pacemaker. On the left is something that looks like a right bundle branch block, and on the right, you see something that looks like a left bundle branch block. Either one of these you might see in a paste rhythm, depending on where the pacemaker is implanted. The important part to look at for this discussion is the isoelectric line, which is the baseline around which the entire rhythm runs north and south. So here is the isoelectric line, and that is the line from which we measure ST elevation and ST depression. So on the left, we see it begins with a very positive, powerful, strong deflection north. And then when it returns, it comes back so fast that it travels a little bit south of that isoelectric line, creating this much ST depression. The ST depression, though, is discordant, meaning the depression is on the opposite side of the isoelectric line from the majority of the QRS. Since it's discordant and it's a paste rhythm, perfectly normal, nothing to write home about. In example B there, we have the left bundle branch type morphology, and it begins with a very powerful downward deflection. So when it rebounds, it rebounds up above the isoelectric line, creating this much ST elevation. Again, it's discordant because the elevation is on the opposite side of the isoelectric line from the majority of the QRS. That is perfectly normal in a paste rhythm and also in a standard bundle branch, left bundle branch block rhythm. Even without a pacemaker, you would see this. Scarbosa came up with three markers of possible STEMI in the presence of these waveforms. The first one in the middle was that five millimeter rule, which she called excessive discordant ST elevation. Some research came around later after she published her article, a man by the name of Smith came along and modified the Scarbosa criteria. So that five millimeter rule has been changed. We're gonna ignore that for the moment and let's go to the lower left. Here we have that very powerful upward deflection of the QRS, and you would expect normally for it to rebound south of the isoelectric line. But that didn't happen in this case. It stopped early, creating this much concordant ST elevation. Concordant ST elevation is a finding of possible STEMI in the presence of a paced rhythm. So that's rule number one. Rule number two here, we get rid of that five millimeter and Smith came along and he changed it. And we'll talk about why in a moment to measuring this amount of discordant ST elevation and comparing it to the depth of the S wave. And Smith suggested that proportionality is more important than a five millimeter rule because these waveforms are so deep and so large that when they rebound, it's reasonable to expect that they rebound above five millimeters. So you really need to do a proportion measurement. And Smith suggested, started at 21, but now it's 25% of the depth. 
So if this discordant ST elevation is more than 25% of the depth of the S wave, that is considered excessive discordant ST elevation, and that is a predictor for STEMI. So how do you measure that? Well, some of you guys have got some pretty impressive tools on your belt when you're riding in the ambulance. This I wouldn't recommend you store on your belt, but it is a very useful tool to have in your bag when you're in the ambulance that you can measure that ST elevation and compare it to the depth of the wave. And if you can fit four of those in the depth of the wave, that's less than 25% of the wave. If you can't fit four of them in, that's more than 25%, you got possible STEMI there. In this third rule, you had that very, very deep negative deflection, and so you would expect the rebound to come up above the isoelectric line, but that didn't happen here. It stopped early, creating this much concordant ST depression. Now this, you'll notice it says there V1, 2, and 3. Those are the leads that you need to see this in order for this rule to apply. That concordant ST depression is a marker for STEMI even in the presence of a left bundle branch or paced rhythm. So here's the original rule that Scarbosa came up with. She assigned various points to each one of these findings. So the most significant one at the top is concordant ST elevation in only one or more leads. It doesn't have to be contiguous leads. It only takes it in one lead in a paced rhythm. That is a finding for STEMI. In the middle there, the concordant ST depression in leads V1, V2, or V3, it only needs to be one millimeter or more, and it only needs to be in one of those leads. And then the lowest number of points goes to excessive discordant ST elevation. Instead of that five millimeter rule, now we use the 25% rule in the Smith modified Scarbosa rule. So that Smith, what he did is he, he published an article and he pointed out some of the drawbacks of the original Scarbosa research. The first criticism was she used CKMB and not angiography. The reasoning behind this criticism is CKMB elevates in both STEMI and non-STEMI, but only STEMI is the, oh my God, let's go straight to the cath lab and get some reperfusion done here kind of uh, patient. Uh, you can't really blame Scarbosa for this because she did, as I said, a post hoc analysis. She was using previous research in order to ask a different question, and they used CKMB. So it might be a weakness of the study, but it's nothing she had any control over. You use the data that you got. The second drawback is the issue of proportionality. What Smith pointed out is, look at these QRS is here. They're so deep and so big, it would be reasonable to expect the rebound to be even greater than five millimeters and still not be a major problem. So Smith suggested that 25% rule should apply instead of the five millimeter rule in order to address proportionality. So the modified or Smith modified Scarbosa criteria is the same as the original Scarbosa criteria with the change of proportionality in the third rule, 25% of the preceding S wave depth. If it exceeds that, boom, you should be thinking STEMI. So here is that first 12 lead we started the whole process off with. I recommend you press pause and take a look at it again and see if anything pops out at you. All right, we're back from that. And let me throw another 12 lead at you, which I took 18 minutes before this one. Do you see anything in this 12 lead of interest? I'm hoping you're seeing some very obvious ST elevation in leads 2, 3, and AVF, and then all the way over on the right in V5 and V6, you're seeing some lateral ST elevation too. So this is very much a STEMI. But the cool part is this middle part here, you have the pacer firing again when it's not firing 
in leads one, two, three, AVR, AVL, AVF, and four, five, and six. No pacer spikes there. The pacer's only firing in that middle segment. So this is literally giving you a snapshot of what pacing does in order to hide STEMI. You have a patient 18 minutes prior. This pacemaker is not having full capture yet. And so there's no pacing going on. And you can see obvious STEMI. And then in the middle, you can see that paste rhythm morphology. But even here under the Scarbosa criteria, there is concordant ST depression going on. And then the pacer stops firing again and we have ST elevation. So let me give you, for those of you who like to uh, chew all the meat off the bone, uh, here is the case, all the details. We have here a 58-year-old African-American male. He is sitting at home with chest pain for hours and hours, but because there's a pandemic with COVID-19 going on, he doesn't want to go to the hospital because that's where sick people are. So he sits at home having this heart attack for quite a while before he finally decides he can't tolerate it anymore, has his wife drive him to the ER, and the ER does a 12 lead, and they find the STEMI. There's no pacer because the pacer was put in later. So they see that STEMI rhythm immediately. He goes to the cath lab, and that's where I found him on the cath lab table. Here's the narrative. Again, if you like to read the details, you can pause and read through the narrative. Uh, this patient in the cath lab was having stents put in, and he kept going into cardiac arrest. And there was extensive damage to his heart, and so they had to do two things. They had to implant a transvenous pacer, which is why the original EKG in the emergency department uh, showed very clear STEMI, because there was no pacing to cover any of it up. And then he goes to the cath lab, and after these procedures... He keeps going into that cardiac arrest, so they have to put in a pacer to keep things firing. And they also found that they had to put in an intraaortic balloon pump in order to maximize the perfusion of his heart. So that's where they called my ambulance service to do the critical care transport from this cath lab down to the ICU at a higher level hospital where he can get the care that they can't provide there. They did RSI, rapid sequence intub intubate him. Uh, and they also gave him a paralytic when they did that. They put him on a ventilator, and they began running. You can see there are five infusions running. They're running heparin at 600 units an hour, amiodarone at a milligram a minute, and propofol at 40 mics per kg per minute, and then fentanyl for uh, to potentiate the propofol and also to deal with the pain, 70 mics an hour and normal saline at 25 an hour. So this patient is unresponsive, unconscious, on a vent, in very bad shape, and on that balloon pump. We loaded the gentleman up and took him down to the ambulance where it took, I think it was about eight or nine people total to lift him and load him into an ambulance. If you've never transported a balloon pump, it is a gigantic heavy machine. The cables are not nearly long enough that you can load the patient in and then load the balloon pump. You have to be lifting everything at the same time. So it's a massive effort on the part of a lot of people just to get the guy into the ambulance. And we ultimately transported uh, down to the ICU. Uh, the patient was in the same condition when we transferred him as he was when we got him. Unfortunately, there was too much damage to his heart for him to recover from everything that went on, and he did not survive his encounter. However, the cool part of this call, as unfortunate as the outcome is for the patient, is this crystal clear comparison of what pacing does to cover up a STEMI. So let's take a really good close look because this is where it's really cool. On the left there, you have unpaced leads one, two, and three, and it's very clear inferior STEMI going on. And then 18 minutes later, when the pacer's in and firing, you can see that all of that STEMI is completely covered up by the pacing. Very cool to see the before and after there. For leads AVR, AVL, and AVF, same thing. On the left, we have no pacer firing, and so you can see 
some ST depression in AVL and clear AVF ST elevation. And on the right, you see the pacer spikes and that AVL, you still see the ST depression, but you lose the ST elevation in AVF. And here we have the precordial leads. It says unpaced on the left, but there are some pacer spikes in one, two, and three. In four, five, and six, they're un unpaced. And on the right side, you can see they're paced all the way through. So right here in V5 and V6, very clear STEMI. And over here, V5 and V6, it all disappears when the pacer's firing. So you see why the doctors for so many years were saying with a paste rhythm or a bundle branch rhythm, you can't make the call for STEMI. But right here, V1 and V2, there is concordant ST depression. So even when all this stuff is disappearing over here, right here is your clue that you got a STEMI going on. We know there's STEMI because we know what's going on with the patient. And there is your clue, that concordant ST depression. Again, for those of you who like to uh, chew all the meat off the bone, here is a, a list of all of the interventions that were performed. And there, once again, is the 12 lead that started it all off. Very, very cool to see the before and after and to have a case. You know, we read about the Scarbosa criteria and they say that the patient has STEMI and they show you the paste rhythm and all that, but it's very cool to be able to see in the same patient within minutes of one 12 lead and another how STEMI gets hidden by the pacer and how you can still see clues that the STEMI is going on if you're watching carefully. Thanks a lot for watching this. I really appreciate it. I encourage you to leave comments so that I uh, can improve my presentation skills. And also there is that link for the cardiac access video so that you can see what I'm talking about when I talk about a different way of looking about cardiac access. Thanks for joining me. Appreciate it. See you the next time.